very good evening to everybody and uh, good morning if you're tuning in in Europe. Uh, we know we've got uh, an audience that spans from Africa to Europe uh, to India, the US and uh, here in Australia. Uh, so wherever, wherever you are that you may be watching, we give you a very, very warm welcome and uh, you know it's our prayer and uh, our hope that you enjoy this evening and that you really get something out of this evening. You know, when we've put together this uh, very important topic, uh, Israel, uh, the promise of restoration. And, you know, when you look around the world, we know this year there's been a lot going on uh, with COVID um, and uh, with other natural disasters that have occurred in various countries. You know, there's a real question around, you know, what is happening in the world today? Well, tonight we're going to focus on Israel and uh, we've got uh, three speakers. Uh, our speakers tonight come from various ecclesias. Uh, for those that uh, aren't part of uh, uh, the group of, of uh, believers that we associate with, that's uh, another word that we use to describe when we come together. We come together as an ecclesia or as a church. Um, and uh, really, uh, we have a speaker from Canterbury. Uh, that's, uh, uh, his name is Josh Wallace. We have a speaker from Blackburn. Uh, that's Jonna Lawson, and we have a speaker from Gosford in New South Wales, and that's uh, Andrew Dangerfield. Uh, so you'll hear from the three of them. Uh, but uh, there's a lot to get through tonight, and uh, we've broken the evening into three sections. So the first section is about Israel's significance, and Josh Wallace is going to speak to that. Uh, we will then look at the current affairs, and as we put in some of the advertising leading up to tonight, there's a lot going on in the Middle East right now. And it's important that we understand what's happening and, and why we should be watching. And uh, then An Andrew Dangerfield is going to finish with uh, Israel's restoration and talk about the future. Uh, so we trust that you'll find it both informative and relevant uh, and relevant to you personally. Uh, so we will have the three speakers rejoin on Wednesday evening, uh, Melbourne time, and they will be doing a live Q&A session. But what we do ask is that if you have questions from this live stream, that you send an email to questions at cce.org.au. Uh, that address will come up on the banner uh, throughout tonight. But if you send that, an email with your questions to, to that address by tomorrow evening, Melbourne time at around 7, 7.30, about the same time as tonight, uh, then uh, we will make sure that the speakers have an opportunity to review and then they will talk to those questions in the Q&A panel on Wednesday. <clears throat> so before we hear from Josh and uh, Israel's significance, we're going to just uh, open our evening with a word of prayer to God. And it's through him that all things are possible. And it's uh, to him that we give all glory. And so if we just uh, ask you just to, to hear this prayer and uh, uh, we will then go straight into Josh Wallace. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to have an opportunity to know you and to know your son, Jesus. Father, we know that it's through you that all things are possible. Heavenly Father, we know that the world is currently in turmoil that we have not seen in many, many years. And Father, despite the challenges that we face, we know that you have a purpose for this earth you know, we know that you have a purpose for us. Father, we just are thankful for your son, Jesus, and that uh, you provided him for us and that he gave himself for us. And Father, as we have this evening together, we pray that it, it brings you glory and that you bless this time together and that those with ears will hear the word and that they may respond to it. Father, we just ask for this blessing now on our speakers tonight, and it's through your son's holy name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome, as has been said, to uh, a three-part program this evening in which we're going to be looking at the overall theme of Israel, the promise of restoration. In this first section on Israel's significance, we've got two very clear questions that we want to answer. 
Uh, the first question is, why is Israel so important to God? And secondly, what does that mean for us? Now, that Israel is significant to God is attested to time and time again as we read through the scriptures. In fact, there's a couple of passages that refer to the nation of Israel as being the apple of God's eye. It's quite an interesting phrase and quite an interesting thought. Uh, the implication of that phrase is that God's uh, attentive gaze is fixed on them. And it's almost as if he's, he's sensitive when it comes to his people, Israel. He, he later says, actually, to, to touch them is to touch the apple of my eye. And, and so the question becomes, why would that be? Why should God's focus and attention be on that nation? Of all the races, why that particular race who have been called uh, down through time and are still called today the Jews or the Jewish people? Well, as we'll see, the reason why Israel is so important to God is because it's the nation that has descended from one particular and very special man. And that man uh, is Abraham. And he was a man who was called to leave his native country. He's called by God to leave his native country and travel to a land which he was to be given. A land called then the land of Canaan, called the land of Israel today. And God made promises to Abraham. He told him, you will have children, Abraham. A nation is going to develop from your descendants. And this is going to be a nation that I will bless, preserve and protect. And that nation will inherit your land, the land that I'm giving you. And as we read on after God gave Abraham these promises, we find that Abraham is described as a man that's right with God. Right with God. And, and why is he right with God? Well, he's right with God on the basis of his faith, his belief and his trust. He's not right with God on the basis of a whole lot of amazing things that he's achieved. It's just faith and trust in God, which does lead to obedience. But he's right on the basis of that faith, which is very interesting. We read on. And we find that in no less than three occasions in scripture, he's referred to as the friend of God. Imagine that. Imagine that for a title, the friend of God. And the nation that resulted from Abraham, as promised, were themselves reminded that this was the reason for their specialness before God. In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, we have here, Verse 14 and 15, behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them. You above all peoples as you are this day. So you see what verse 14 is saying is God had a lot to choose from. He's the, he's the God of the heavens, but he's chosen you, Israel. He set his heart in love on you. Why? Because of your fathers, he says. And by that, by the phrase fathers, he's referring to the patriarchal fathers of the Jewish race. Abraham, as we've seen, Abraham's son, Isaac, and Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And ever since that time, God's eyes have been on his people. He, he promised Abraham that he would look after them and he kept his promise and he invited the nation of Israel into this covenant relationship with him after they left Egypt. They accepted the terms of that covenant and they became his witnesses to the nations around that God exists. But there were consequences under this covenant relationship that he had with his people. 
They were to be blessed for obedience, but they were to be cursed for disobedience. But their disobedience, and this is one of the keys, was never going to overturn the faithfulness of God to the original promises that he made to Abraham. God's promise to Abraham was inviolate. And in a sense, it wasn't dependent in terms of its fulfillment, in terms of God's faithfulness to these promises, they weren't to be dependent on the obedience or disobedience of the nation that followed. Now we have this um, beautiful passage here in Isaiah 41, but you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its father's corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous, just hand. And faithful to those words, what we'll see is that the Lord God has been with this people. He has upheld them. Now, in a sense, we've just answered the first of those questions. Why is Israel important to God? It's because of the relationship that God had with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the fathers of the Jewish nation. And so our second question was, well, what does this mean for us? Well, you see, it wasn't just that Abraham would have his own son. It wasn't just that his family would grow and, and he would develop this unique race of people that are going to be in covenant relationship with Almighty God, although that's all true. It's that of all the hero deliverers, that were to come through the line and through the descendants of Abraham, there ultimately was going to be one who would be the anointed one. There was going to be one who would be the Messiah. And uh, the promises to Abraham were expanded a number of times and to the point where it was understood that he was going to have a particular child that would be born to your descendants and he would save the world or he would bless all nations and that was of course the lord jesus christ and that's what it means for us you see because through all the uh, centuries as the nation of israel developed god had been concealing as it were a secret hidden through that period of time through these ages but revealed at an appropriate time was that although a Jew himself, and although the champion of his race, Jesus would be the means by which blessing would flow to all members of the human race. And, and non-Jews could also become the recipients of Abraham's promises on the same basis that Abraham himself was to be given them. And what was that basis? Remember, we might, have, we might remember we mentioned it earlier. The basis would be through faith, through belief, trust, and obedience to God. And that was a wonderful secret, the wonderful mystery that was revealed in Jesus Christ. And uh, the Apostle Paul uh, in the New Testament wrote to a group of believers of Jesus in this region called Galatia. And in chapter three of this letter, he says here, verse seven, the real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures look forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. And uh, the passage goes on in uh, verse 26, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. 
There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. And so was revealed this, this wonderful mystery that answers our second question as to what Israel's significance to God means for us. It means the opportunity to be saved through adoption into the hope of Israel. It means that through a process of adoption almost, we can become part of Abraham's family. Uh, scheduled, as it were, to receive all the blessings that are going to come on the nation of Israel in the future. But what of the nation of Israel? What of the Jews? Well, sadly, they rejected Jesus. Most refused to accept him as their Messiah. They missed or they ignored the signs that he really was who he claimed to be, and they were complicit along with the Romans, in putting him to death. And when they did that, not that they knew this at the time, but as far as their nation was concerned, the, the nation was about to go through a period of turmoil that it had never been through before. In fact, you could almost say that the blights were about to go out on this nation. The nation was on the verge of being evicted from their land and scattered by the Romans in fulfilment of an ancient prophecy that would be triggered by their disobedience. And here's that prophecy uh, here in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Sobering words. For the Lord will scatter you among all the nations from one end of the earth to the other. And it goes on in verse 65. There among those nations, you will find no peace or place to rest. And the Lord will cause your heart to tremble, your eyesight to fail and your soul to despair. Your life will constantly hang in the balance. You will live night and day in fear, unsure if you will survive. And after the events of AD 70 and for centuries afterwards, the Jews were caused to literally wander among the nations, a persecuted people, a hunted people, evicted, expelled. And uh, we can read the history of the way that the Jews suffered during times like the Spanish Inquisition. They were uh, subjected to all sorts of Russian pogroms. They were slandered, they were derided. And yet, they were also given a tenacity that meant that no nation was able to completely destroy them. They were, against all odds, as it were, able to maintain their unique identity to such an extent that thinking people were baffled over the centuries by, by this phenomenon that is the Jewish people. I've got one example of uh, a thinking person uh, pondering this question. Leo uh, Tolstoy, the Russian author, wrote this. What is the Jew? What kind of unique creature is this whom all the rulers of the nations of the world have disgraced and crushed and expelled and destroyed, persecuted, burned and drowned, and who, despite their anger and their fury, continues to live and to flourish? What is this Jew whom they have never succeeded in enticing with all the enticements in the world, whose oppressors and persecutors only suggested that he deny and disown his religion and cast aside the faithfulness of his ancestors. See, the Jew would never do it. He would never do that, despite the pressure. The Jew, he writes, is the symbol of eternity. He is the one who for so long has guarded the prophetic message and transmitted it to all mankind. A people such as this, can never disappear. The Jew is eternal. And, and you know, we, we have a clear, unequivocal scriptural answer as to why the Jew seems so eternal. The secret of his immortality is his significance before God 
on account of the promises he made to their forefather Abraham and the blessing to the world that he's outworking and unfolding through Abraham's descendant, Jesus Christ. And, and notice that Tolstoy mentions the prophetic message. The, the Jews did preserve the prophetic messages and those messages kept alive their hope. What was their hope? The hope of restoration. In fact, the Jews were convinced that the hope of restoration to their ancestral homeland was a live hope through all these years. And it meant that through all these centuries, there was a greeting that was forever on their lips. Mashana Haba Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. And they maintained that hope. And they did so because of the prophetic messages. They did so because they had the Hebrew scriptures. They were aware of passages like this one here in Ezekiel 37. And give them this message from the sovereign Lord. I will gather the people of Israel from among the nations. I will bring them home to their own land from the places where they have been scattered. I will unify them into one nation on the mountains of Israel. I will bring them home. And there were many non-Jews also over the century reading these scriptures, watching the Jewish nation, being witnessed to by the miracle that was the Jewish nation's survival and existence. And they too were reading these Hebrew scriptures. These are people who have read Galatians 3 and are now in covenant relationship with God through Jesus. And they could see that the Jews were going to be restored to their land. And here's one such Bible student writing, uh, John Thomas, writing in 1852. Think about that. He says this, he says, testimony and reason thereupon show that there must be a resettlement of the land by the Jews to a limited extent before the Battle of Armageddon. That will speak in unmistakable and infallible terms to the believer. And I would say also to the unbeliever. The miracle of Israel, what God has achieved with them, speaks to the unbeliever, gives them grounds for faith, as we'll see. They will speak in unmistakable and infallible terms to the believer. It will be a sure and certain sign of a speedy appearing of the Son of Man in power and glory. No one need expect that appearing to be manifested until a Jewish colony be lifted up as an ensign upon a hill. So in 1852, what he was saying there is, is look, there will be the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He firmly believed that. Before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be, he says, the battle of Armageddon. But before both of those things, he said, I expect to see the return of Israel to the land. I expect to see a Jewish colony thrive in that locality. He's writing in 1852. Well, there was to be one last dreadful calamity that the Jews suffered in Europe. Sadly, before World War II was over, the Jewish Holocaust had claimed the lives of more than 6 million Jews in the death camps of Nazi Germany. And you might say that immediately after this, the state of Jewish aspirations, any aspirations, were hopeless, beyond retrieval, beyond hope of restoration. Surely next year in Jerusalem was a dream, a hopeless dream. And yet the God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel had been unfolding this multi-millennial plan with his people. And, and really, the stage was set for one of the most miraculous periods in history, one of the most dramatic fulfillments of Bible prophecy in the modern era. Out of these dire and desperate circumstances, God was 
about to bring his people home. Well, I think a big thank you to Josh uh, for doing such a remarkable job there in introducing uh, tonight's subject and especially the focus around Israel's significance. Uh, we know there from the promises that God has made and uh, from the prophecy that's uh, through the Old Testament and into the New uh, that it's, it's very, very relevant. Um, and it's a nice segue that then takes us into current affairs. So... You know, we see this story of, of Israel unfold and to uh, take us forward, uh, I'll just ask uh, John Lawson to, uh, to continue our journey this evening with uh, the current affairs. Well, thanks very much for that, um, Mark, and thanks very much for that, Josh, for that really great introduction to the nation of Israel. Well, Josh has left us, hasn't he, at the... Um, one of the darkest periods in all the history of mankind at the end of World War II. But out of the ashes of World War II, as was prophesied previously, as Josh has mentioned, the Jewish nation would rise again to reclaim their homeland. Now, previously, uh, men um, like Theodore Herzl had tried to get the Jewish people out of Europe to return to Israel, but he'd been largely unsuccessful. But, of course, after the events of World War II, the, the, the Jewish people, particularly from Europe, streamed into Israel as a new homeland because they had no homeland or felt no longer that the nations in Europe were a home for them. So ships like this one here, a very famous ship, the Exodus, moved into the nation of Israel and thousands of people came into Israel to reform a nation. And amazingly, out of the dust and ashes that was the Holocaust, the people of Israel built a homeland. And just a few years after World War II had finished, in 1948, here we have the, Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister, the first Prime Minister of Israel, on the 14th of May, 1948, announcing the rebirth of the nation of Israel in their original homeland. And in yellow here on the map, you can see the original area, which the UN voted one year later, would be the area of land officially known as the nation of Israel. Now, right from this moment of its rebirth, Israel would suffer uh, a tough time of building their nation they would suffer conflict almost immediately from their birth. And I guess we just want to look very briefly at the, next, the first 70 years of this nation's history. And I think it can be divided well into two 30-year periods and the last 10 years. The first 30 years were 30 years of conflict and struggling to survive. Then the next 30 years were a move towards peace with their neighbours. And finally, over the last 10 years, we've seen the nation prosper economically in, their na in the nation of Israel. So right from the very beginning, the nation of Israel suffered almost from day one the conflict from all these nations that you can see around. Uh, after they declared themselves a nation, all these nations joined in alliance uh, in an Arab confederacy and invaded the nation of Israel. And the War of Independence would last 12 months after their rebirth in 1948. And the nation of Israel, amazingly, and we believe by a miracle, was able to survive that particular war and establish themselves as a nation in Israel. And they began to grow really, really quickly. Their population boomed over the first 10 years to the early 60s, where they had uh, the, a, a population of over 2 million people already. But they experienced, again, conflict all around them because the Arab nations didn't believe that they should exist. And so in 1967, again, the nations of Egypt, Jordan and Syria decided that they were going to invade the nation of Israel. But this time, Israel, who has always had a very close allegiance to uh, the nation of the United States, were tipped off by our intelligence that Israel, uh, that they were going to be invaded. And so they were able to, very early on in 1967, 
in June of that year, they were able to preemptively strike before these nations were able to invade them. So on the 10th of June, 1967, Israel launched a, a strike into these nations to, to, um, in order to, to strike their military so that they wouldn't be able to come in and invade them as a nation. And the plan worked. And even though Jordan and Egypt and Syria moved into the nation of Israel, far from taking any land, from the nation of Israel, Israel again, amazing, were able to repel this uh, group of nations and establish themselves again in their homeland. And it was at this time that they moved to take the nation, the, the city of Jerusalem, which to this point they hadn't actually had as part of their land. Now, the Six Day War is famous in the history of the early establishment of Israel as an example of the, the tenacity of the people of the ingenuity of the military of, of the um, Israelis. But it was in the scripture before any of this had happened that the nation of Israel would take again that, that city of Jerusalem. And it was God ultimately, we believe, who was in charge of the movements of this particular nation. Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 21 and verse 24, he said, it referring to the nation of Israel and how they would be originally moved out of their homeland by the Romans in AD 70. He said they will fall by the edge of the sword and they're going to be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem itself will be trampled underfoot. And we saw that in some of the, the slides that Josh showed us. And they would be, it would be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. But Jesus said that that would not always be the case. He said, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And at the end of the times of the Gentiles, Israel again would move and occupy the city of Jerusalem as they remarkably did in 1967. Now, the aftermath of that war was that Israel, not only did they preserve the land they had, but they moved into all these other parts and extended the territory of the nation of Israel. They moved into the Sinai Peninsula, into Gaza and up into the Golan Heights and extended their regime. They later moved, uh, moved to give back parts of the West Bank to the Jordanians and, of course, the Palestinians. But the conflict didn't end there. And just a few years later, in 1973, on what is the most important religious day of the year for Israel, the Day of Atonement, or called Yom Kippur, again, Egypt and Syria decided to invade the nation of Israel and take back the territory that had been taken from them. Now, Israel was taken completely by surprise in this attack again. And although just three weeks later again they made a miraculous victory, this time they were aware of how vulnerable they were. And they thought, particularly given other events that were happening and negativity they were receiving from around the world, that perhaps from this point on, attack towards peace with some of their neighbours would be a better long-term solution for them. And so they did exactly that. In 1979, just a few years after that Yom Kippur War, they were able to broker a peace deal with Egypt. And this was a remarkable peace agreement of the time, and it was brokered over by the United States. Here in the picture we have Jimmy Carter, um, we've got Enwar Sadat, who was the leader of the Egyptians, and Begin, who was the Prime Minister of um, Israel at the time. And they agreed upon an economic and security peace agreement whereby the nations could live at one. And Israel, as part of that agreement, gave back the Sinai Peninsula, which they had taken in 1967. Now, this began some years, and it's, it's really what's led to what we're even seeing in the last couple of months in the world around us. It has led from this moment on to a, a, a pattern of peace which Israel has tried to negotiate with their neighbours. And so in 1994, they again struck a similar peace agreement with the nation of Jordan. Here we have Bill Clinton, who was president at the time, um, with uh, Yitzhak Rabin and also Majali, who was the leader of the, Jordan, the Kingdom of Jordan at the time. And they, like Egypt, struck a peace deal with Israel to dwell securely and have economic ties with that nation. Now, this continuation of peace progressed into the year 2000, where 
Um, Bill Clinton again orchestrated uh, peace talks with this time the leader of the Palestinians, who was Yasser Arafat, and also the Prime Minister at the time, Yitzhak Rabin. Now, this was a much more complex peace deal and one that didn't come off straight away and is still not uh, decided to this day because of the complexity in which uh, the regions of the Palestinians and the Israelis have to try and dwell together. But that was the beginning of this peace agreement. As part of that first stage, a couple of years later, the Israelis gave back to the Palestinians the area of Gaza, which again they had taken during the 1967 war. And again, for over the last 10 to 20 years, Israel has continued to try and develop these peace agreements with the nations around them. Now, from about the year 2010, we're into the, next, the last decade, Israel then had a period of enormous prosperity. And this has been driven by a number of things. The first one was that they discovered in the early parts of the 2010s some enormous energy reserves particularly some in the Mediterranean Sea, the largest of which was called the uh, Leviathan Natural Gas um, Discovery. And with those huge energy discoveries, Israel has become completely energy self-sufficient. And not only has it got enough energy for itself for the foreseeable future, it has also been able to export energy to or into Europe and other neighbouring countries and develop a huge... Um, economy around these energy finds. The other thing that Israel has done is it's moved into um, the high-tech area of its economy. And it's done this with remarkable success over the last 10 years. I think in the world today, Israel is rated as the country, only behind the United States, as the country with the most technology startups in its country. And it's had remarkable success at being able to grow these particular uh, companies. Probably the most successful and famous of which is Intel, which is uh, headquartered in the nation of Israel. In this book from a few years ago, Dan Senor uh, was, was talking about this phenomenon in Israel, uh, about the startup nation that they are. And he said, it is a story that, it is a story not just of talent, but of tenacity of insatiable questioning of authority, of determined informality, combined with a unique attitude towards failure, teamwork, mission, risk, and cross-disciplinary creativity. And he goes on to show in that book that one of the reasons he believes why Israel has been so successful in, in starting up business in this area is because of all of the young people and their, um, their origins in the military. Every person that comes through after they've finished school has to do two years of compulsory military service. And then they go on to do their university studies. And those two things combine to create an extremely disciplined young workforce that are completely driven to succeed. And I think that quotation also gives us a little bit of an insight into uh, the psyche of the modern-day Israeli. They are very much about self-belief about uh, achieving things for themselves, about solving their own problems, about standing up for themselves against their neighbouring military, military uh, countries around them. They are very self-sufficient. As a nation, they are actually quite um, anti-religious. Um, in a recent poll, almost 30 to even 40% of the nation of Israel proclaimed themselves to be either atheist or agnostic. They are very much a nation that believes in themselves and that they have the destiny of their own future. And this is something particularly that I believe that the scripture tells us that God is going to work a miracle in that nation to bring them once again to see him as the, their God, as the commander in chief over them. Now, recent years in the Trump years, over the last five years, over the last four years. Trump, because of his very close relationship with the Prime Minister ben Benjamin Netanyahu, has brought about a lot of activity. And we've seen in 2019 that the US established their embassy in, in the city of Jerusalem. And here we have, of course, Trump's oldest daughter, Ivanka, and her husband, Trump's 
uh, Donald Trump's um, son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who has been one of the primary mover, movers over the last four years in establishing new relationships and stability with Israel and some of its other neighbours. And some of those discussions and negotiations have come to a head just over the last few years. No, sorry, even the last few months, um, where we've seen in August and, and later in the last month of December, some of these new peace agreements between the United Arab, Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Now, these agreements are amazing because a lot of these nations have hated Israel for years and denied even their right of existence. But this peace agreement has brought them together. Here's a photo from the Israeli Foreign Department showing the, the flag of the UAE on display after those peace agreements were signed. And they were called the Abraham Accords because, of course, all these countries have descended from that one man that Josh spoke about, that man Abraham. And the Israeli ambassador to the US said this about those agreements. Abraham, as you know, was the father of all three great faiths. No person better symbolises the potential for unity between these three great faiths than Abraham. This is why that accord has been given that name. So this is a peace agreement to the name of Abraham that it is believed will bind these nations together for good and bring peace to the, the region. Of course, Trump, Donald Trump chimed in, as he loves to do, um, and it, it, of acknowledgement of these historic events which have happened over the last few weeks. It's an historic day for peace, he says, in the Middle East. I am welcoming leaders from Israel, the United Arab Emirates and the Kingdom of Bahrain to the White House to sign landmark deals that no one thought was possible. More countries are to follow. And some of those countries that people believe may sign agreements soon are even the nation of Saudi Arabia, which is, of course, a major nation in the region. So in Israel's short 70 years history, we have seen a nation develop amazingly to a nation which is extremely prosperous in the world today. It is economically strong, built on a high-tech industry which has a huge potential into the future. We also see a nation that is secure, that has a, huge, a vast and high-tech military that has been able to protect it through many, many wars. And we're also seeing now a nation which is brokering peace with some of its closest neighbours, which previously seemed impossible. So what does the future hold? Well, we might look at that region now and think, well, everything looks like it's going fine. And Israel is looking by its own might to develop these peaceful relationships and hopefully that will grow to bring peace to all the Middle East by their own might and their own power. But there is a prophet which Josh referred to, the prophet Ezekiel, that said that when you see Israel in a very similar position to what you see it in today, a nation that is dwelling prosperously, securely and at peace, be aware that very soon after that time will occur the greatest event which is recorded that will happen in the Bible, and that is the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. And what will bring that about, Ezekiel says in verse 38, is a conflict in the Middle East, an invader which we are told in Ezekiel chapter 38 will be to the north geographically of Israel, will come down into Israel and invade it. Look what Ezekiel says in verse 8. In the latter years, you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, and we've seen that, haven't we, which have been continual, continually waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples now and now dwell securely, all of them. The prophet goes on to, to describe what Israel would be like when this northern invader would come. All of them would be dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates. To seize spoil, the enemy will come, and to carry away great plunder. To turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited and the people gathered from the nations. So we're told briefly here in Ezekiel chapter 38 that a northern invader will come down and invade the nation of Israel, 
and will take this great spoil and prosperity that this nation has been able to build. But we are also told in that chapter that Israel will be not left to perish completely. But at this moment of their worst and most dire need, the prophet says that it's at this point that the apple of God's eye, as Josh described them as, will be seen by God. And his son, Jesus, will come to save that nation. Verse 18 to 22 of Ezekiel chapter 38 says, but on that day, the day that Gog shall come against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, my wrath will be roused in my anger and I will summon a sword against Gog, a description of this northern confederacy. On all my mountain, declares the Lord God. Jesus Christ, the Bible describes, will return to save his people Israel. And not just to save them physically, but to redeem them. He will be their saviour. And though they rejected him initially when he first came, they will come to see him for who he is, the son of the living God, and they will be united with him as he moves to occupy and take over this world. Great, thanks, Jonna. And uh, well, I mean, we know that Israel have had a very uh, interesting history and has uh, been been constant source of an area of conflict. Um, I think you've, you've really been able to illustrate you know, the past 70 years and just how important they've been in terms of current affairs. Uh, we also know that uh, uh, just recently the BBC reported in the past few days that there are some talks with Lebanon uh, about the maritime borders and, and trying to come to some uh, better agreement there around peace. Um, we also know from, from some of the statistics that Christianity is is really growing at a fast rate in, in Israel. So whilst there is a significant percentage of the population that say that they don't believe in anything or they believe in themselves, there are some that are already turning to Jesus Christ as their saviour, which is, which is wonderful. Um, I think, you know, we know that uh, Israel will still have challenge ahead of it, um, but uh, there is a promise. And uh, to take us through that third section, I'll pass over to Andrew Dangerfield, who, who will talk about Israel's restoration. All right, we can see that all okay. Really good. All right, thanks, uh, everyone. And um, it's uh, really nice to be able to talk about Israel, uh, an incredibly exciting subject, one that I really love. And this is now what we're going to do in this third session now for about 20 minutes or so is have a look at the end of the story. This is what we're going to look at, the end of the story, the glorious conclusion to what we've seen with Israel. And the prophet Isaiah, we'll be looking at the prophet Isaiah a bit, and I'm just going to really in this session really let the Bible do the talking because the Bible is very straightforward on this subject, which is wonderful. For Zion's sake, says Isaiah, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nation shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. So Isaiah, in that beautiful section of chapters from Isaiah, really 59 through to 66, describes the way in which Israel is to be saved. And Israel will be saved only when they acknowledge Jesus Christ as their saviour. And God's going to bring about events very soon, as Jonah has said, um, to actually cause that to come about. So go, let's go back for a moment to the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 45 to 50. Some of us uh, who know our Bibles a bit or know a bit about Gen the book of Genesis uh, will know that there's a lot of chapters about this man, Joseph. And we say, why is it that 
Yes, there's a lot of chapters about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the early fathers of Israel. But why then at the end of Genesis so much about Joseph? Well, we're only going to just mention this very briefly now. But I believe it's because there are so many similarities in the life of Joseph to the life of Jesus that God is telling us in the very first book of the Bible that the solution to all the problems in the lives of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are found in the life of Jesus Christ, of which Joseph was just a similarity or a type, what we would call a type, an example of. And at the end of a very long time of testing, when Joseph was in Egypt and he had not seen his brothers for around 20 years or so, Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, who, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, that was an incredible shock to his brothers. They just, the, they would have been collapsed on the floor in absolutely stunned silence. They thought that Joseph would have, was dead and buried, would, was gone long ago. And there he was. And so it will be with Jesus Christ. And what God does in the first book of the Bible is he brings us into an emotional relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and with his nation Israel. He, he gets us caught into the story, this wonderful story of the fathers of Israel and, the, and Joseph who was sold into Egypt. And so in the same way Joseph was sold off by his brothers into captivity, so Jesus Christ was put to death by his brothers, the Jews. But the time is coming where Jesus will come to his brothers, the nation of Israel. And I think that's why there's so much detail in Genesis about that. Now let's have a look here at the kingdom of God on earth. The kingdom of God on earth is the restored kingdom of Israel. Or we could say, of course, that it's not just the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Israel will be the nucleus of the kingdom of God, which will spread to the whole world. But it will be centred in Israel and it will include the nation of Israel, national Israel. Now, that might seem hard to believe today when we look at Israel today, but there is going to be a dramatic change very soon. Ezekiel, in his prophecy, Ezekiel has a lot to say about this subject. Talking about the last king of Israel, Zedekiah, Thou wicked prince of Israel, he was down in the southern kingdom actually of Judah, whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end. Thus says the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. It shall be no more. That's the nation of Israel, the Jews in the land. Judah would be no more until it come, he come, whose right it is and I will give it to him. And this was said 600 years before Jesus, that the crown was going to be taken off the kings of Israel and Judah until he come whose right it is. And Jesus Christ has not yet returned to become king of Israel. Micah 4 says, O you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come. The former dominion shall come, kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. And so all the prophets tell the same story, that despite Israel's failure and rejection of God and ultimately rejection of their Messiah, Jesus, the time is going to come when they would respond and God will set up the kingdom in Israel. And that hasn't happened yet. Now, the disciples understood this. There's a beautiful scripture at the beginning of Acts, and there's our quote on the screen there. Acts chapter 1. Verses 3 and verse 6. Jesus, you might, uh, if you've read any of the book of Acts, you will see that Jesus Christ goes to heaven right at the beginning, in the first 11 verses of Acts. But he presented himself for a short while to them before he went to heaven to be with his father. And it says what he taught, taught them about. He says for 40 days he spoke to them there about the kingdom of God. So you imagine listening to Jesus for 40 days about the kingdom of God. And the disciples had one important question once he'd done that, talked to them for 40 days about the kingdom of God. They said to him, 
Lord, will it you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? See, they understood, didn't they, that the kingdom of God was a restoration of the kingdom to Israel. Of course, naturally, the disciples would say after listening to Jesus for all that period of time, are you going to do it now? Will it be at this time? At the beginning of Jesus' life, of course, this was said as well. In fact, this is before Jesus was born. The angel speaking to Mary came to say to Mary when she was pregnant with child with the Lord Jesus. The angel said that the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Very clear, isn't it? And Luke chapter 1, when Zechariah, speaking by inspiration at the birth of, 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 of the promise, actually, of, of the birth of John the Baptist, said, as, and, and Zechariah said, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. So this promise given at the beginning of the New Testament, before Jesus was born, before John the Baptist was born, was that Jesus, God would fulfil his promise to bring the kingdom to Israel and that Jesus Christ is the one who's going to do that. And Jesus, of course, taught this, didn't he? In Matthew 19, he taught to his disciples. He says, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the regeneration, of course, we could say, well, we understand the regeneration is when God regenerates the earth and makes the earth a beautiful place again and restores and regenerates the destruction of the environment. And that's true. Many scriptures speak of that. But here he's, he's giving an extra dimension to this. He's saying that the Jewish people will be regenerated. They will be regenerated because they will appreciate that Jesus Christ is their Messiah and that they, this will be a spiritual regeneration. And Christ will come to restore all things. It will be the national restoration of Israel. Acts chapter 3, when the apostles were preaching, they said, repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that the times of, the re of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he might send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So that the message was in the book of Acts that God was going to bring his son to fulfill all those prophecies. Those prophecies are not dead and buried. They are yet to be fulfilled, and it's Jesus Christ who will fulfill those prophecies. Again, in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is wonderful for seeing what the, what the gospel is all about because it's what the apostles preached after Christ went to heaven. In Acts, it says that the word of the prophets agree as they, as they preached. Just as it is written, he's quoting from Amos, after this will I return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may see the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. And there's an artist's depiction of the temple which will be built in Jerusalem with running living waters that will come out of Jerusalem into the Dead Sea and will heal the Dead Sea and regenerate the earth. Amos 9 is where the apostles are quoting from. And we'll see that the gospel of the kingdom is intimately connected with Israel's salvation. Here's the scripture that they're quoting from in, in Acts. Here it is. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. It's a bit like Ezekiel, isn't it? What we read in Ezekiel 21 and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, 
Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the ploughman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. What a wonderful story. And you might say, well, how on earth is that going to come about? How's it going to happen? Well, as John has said, there's going to be a coming conflict. Zechariah says when Jerusalem will be a burdensome stone for all people and all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And this is another subject in itself, of course. But there's going to be this final conflict in the land of Israel when nations who are hostile, a northern group of nations, not not the southern Arab nations who are now making peace with Israel, a northern group of nations led by Russia with other countries such as Iran and Iraq and others to the north will invade the land of Israel. And all nations will be gathered to Jerusalem to battle, says Zechariah in chapter 14, where it tells the same story. Joel 3 says, he gives a time frame and says when this is going to happen. Joel says, behold, in those days and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah, 1948, and Jerusalem, 1967, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and my heritage Israel. So this conflict will bring about a final crisis for the nation of Israel and Israel will finally acknowledge Jesus as their king. Now, John quoted from Ezekiel 38. When you go to Ezekiel 39, it says, So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. And God will roar from Zion, says Joel. He will utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and earth shall quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. So shall you know that I am the Lord, your God, who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy. And Joel continues and says, in that day the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of the acacias. And and there's also, you'll see that in Isaiah 41, Zechariah 14. Many, many scriptures in the Old Testament describe the geographical changes that will take place in the land of Israel that will actually show that God is reigning in Zion because he will regenerate the earth because Israel themselves have become regenerated. And it's worth just mentioning, as just an aside here really, that there are two stages to the deliverance of Israel. The first stage is that Jesus Christ will save the tents of Judah first, and I'm quoting there from Zechariah 12. This is immediately after the Battle of Armageddon, the crisis in Jerusalem, and the Jewish people in the land of Israel will turn to their God because of acknowledging Jesus Christ as their Messiah. But the second phase of restoration is the prophet Elijah, who will lead the second exodus to recover all Jews outside the land of Israel, and he will lead them back to the land of Israel. And there's probably 20 or 30 or 40 quotes that refer to the work of Elijah. In fact, the final verses of the Old Testament refer to the work of Elijah to bring the Jews back to their Messiah, Jesus Christ. This is a a beautiful story. It's a wonderful story and one which we hope will be very soon. And so really as we come towards the conclusion of our night together, we can say for certain that God has a purpose to save Israel. And a classic quote on this is Romans 11. New Testament quote. Paul says, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. They are beloved for the Father's sakes. And he quotes Isaiah 59 and says, all Israel will be saved. 
as it is written, Isaiah 59, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And Isaiah 59 says that that happens when the enemy comes in like a flood. And so Israel as a nation will repent. Jeremiah 31 says that the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. What a beautiful story. And that's a story that we could refer to many dozens of scriptures that tell the same story from the Old Testament. And this is what we want to conclude on, everyone. This is a glorious hope. This is something that gives us real hope. God's kingdom on earth is an absolute reality because the saving of the nation of Israel is proof that the grace God is willing to extend to his people can also be extended to the nations. It can be extended to all of us. God is not willing that any should perish. If God is willing to save his, na- his, his people, Israel, after thousands of years of unbelief, isn't he work- willing to work with us? Of course he is. And that's going to be the witness of Israel to the world. Isaiah says in Isaiah 2, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so, everyone, thanks uh, for joining our session and uh, thanks for involving us in this session tonight. It's it's a wonderful subject. And I, I would just say that we go away and let's read the Bible for ourselves and pray to God that these events might come to pass very soon. Thanks, everyone. That was fantastic, Andrew. And... I I think when we give consideration to Israel's journey, the promises that God has made and the covenant that he has, um, and it it certainly events will transpire that will be a catalyst for peace. And that's something that we too can partake in and we're invited to share in the kingdom of God uh, along with uh, the Jews at that time. We've, tonight we've, we've gone on a, a real journey and it's been power packed. Uh, there's no doubt that each of those topics in themselves is a study on its own. So to really give 20 minutes to each of our speakers, uh, they've done, done a, an exceptional job in really pulling together the salient points uh, to give us an overview within that short period of time but I'd really like to extend my gratitude to our three speakers this evening. They've done a a wonderful job and uh, hopefully you, you feel that uh, there is a great lot of information that you've been able to take away and that it's really relevant to you personally. Uh, As we talked about uh, earlier, there is the opportunity to post questions and our three speakers will return on Wednesday evening. It's a slightly different time. It's half an hour later. So it will start at eight o'clock and um, that's a Q and a panel session where any question that you uh, submit to us at questions at cce.org.au, you know, they will be able to respond to and talk about uh, and give a little bit more detailed information that perhaps uh, they haven't had the opportunity to cover off this evening, given our time. Uh, you, you may go back and watch the YouTube uh, stream as many times as you like. In fact, you can send that stream on to friends and family and people who think you might be, who might be interested in hearing about Israel and why we think it's so significant and, and and about God's promise of Israel's restoration. And it's something that is very special and we ask that you share it. Uh, so again, if, if you do post questions, we ask that you do so by uh, about 7.30 p.m. Melbourne time on Monday. 
and uh, that, that way there is time for the speakers to just review those questions and think about a response. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we would just like to uh, just close with, with prayer and um, we'll just ask that you just uh, quieten your hearts as we just dedicate this time to God. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you again and we just thank you so much for the time that we could spend this evening just dwelling upon Israel's journey and your promises for the nation of Israel. And whilst there are people that scattered, were scattered, have come back together and reformed in Jerusalem. Father, we know that your plan is not yet complete and it will only be complete when Jesus reigns in your kingdom on this earth. Father, we thank you for the blessings that we share and the opportunity to have a relationship with you through your son. Father, as we now leave this uh, virtual call that we ask for your blessing on us and that uh, the words tonight may provoke us to deeper thought and deeper study of the Bible so that we may know your will. Father, we ask that you keep us safe and bring us back together on Wednesday night when we'll hear more about Israel and the promise of restoration. And it's through Jesus we offer this prayer. Amen. Well, thank you again, everybody. And again, uh, we'll pop up the uh, just a slide now with that email address, uh, questions at cce.org.au. Thanks very much.